13 million dollars. They're not paying out because of police wrongdoing. They're paying it out to police. We'll explain. The reporting comes from the LA Times. A jury awarded 13.1 million in damages. That was on Wednesday. And two male Los Angeles police officers who sued the city for gender discrimination, alleging they were singled out in an internal investigation into whoever drew a Hitler like mustache on an arrestee are getting the money. The case stems from a January 2017 incident in which officers Stephen Glick, Alfred Garcia, and their two female police partners responded to a suspected drunk driving collision. Again, they're reporting from the LA Times who's chronicled the suit. The officers arrested a motorist after he was found passed out in his jail cell. He was taken to an area hospital, according to the suit. Two days later, the man lodged a complaint with the police department alleging that his eyebrows and mustache had been shaved off and someone had drawn various objects on his body with a Sharpie, including that Hitler style mustache, eyebrows, male genitalia, and also spelled out a Spanish slur that roughly translates to male prostitute. According to the suit, when the department launched an investigation into the incident, internal affairs detectives automatically cast suspicion on the pair rather than their female partners. Now this, the suit contends, despite evidence suggesting the two male officers were never left alone with the arrestee. Glick's body worn camera was on for the duration of the arrest with the exception of 12 minutes. When the man was being booked at Newton Division Station by Glick and his female partner, again, according to the suit. Attorney Matt McNicholas, who filed the suit on the officer's behalf, said all of the evidence pointed to gender discrimination, from focusing on the males to the exclusion of the females. According to the suit, then police chief Charlie Beck, remember him? Eventually recommended the officers be fired for allegations of battery. And they were directed to a disciplinary panel called a board of rights. Now the suit cites testimony from Los Angeles Police Protective League Director Jamie McBride, that man. Who says he was told by a department official the officers were being investigated because quote, this is what guys do, not females. Mm. Ever watch The Real Housewives? I'm just <laughs> saying. McBride said in a deposition he learned that paramedics have been known for years to, well, scrawl messages on patients they're transporting, which he later told department officials. Hmm. No officers rode in the ambulance with the injured suspect to the hospital, the suit says. Glick and Garcia were eventually cleared of wrongdoing without appearing before a board of rights panel, but they still suffered career setbacks as a result of the incident, their suit says. After four days of testimony, the jury came back with a unanimous verdict awarding the officers damages. The city could still contest the monetary amount. Spokesman for the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office declined to comment on the matter. I'm not sure where I come down on this one just yet. I have certain things that are sticking out in my mind, Jeff. I want you to go first and react to the monetary amount, $13.1 million, and the underlying facts that the jury essentially found. Yeah, what my brain keeps going to is this point where it says McBride said in a deposition that he learned that paramedics have been known for years to scrawl messages on patients they are transporting, which he later told department officials. So as you alluded to earlier, if this situation messed up the careers of two police officers, then who are the ones who actually did this and what's happening to their careers right now? Yeah, and were they promoted, okay? We've learned and there's different departments out there and this kind of thing goes on everywhere. But I think things like the Kobe Bryant, that tragedy and the things that we discovered, Sheriff's Department, um, it's unsettling. But so is this. I don't know what kind of you know person says that well, women don't do this, guys do. 
I mean, there's perhaps a lot of things you could separate amongst the sexes. But police are blue and someone did this or perhaps paramedics. It's a sisterhood, brotherhood, whatever you want to call it. So I, I don't know who would say that and why you wouldn't figure out, go through all the body cam footage and really kind of pin things down because that jumped out at me too. How come we still don't know who did do it? Well, for me personally, <laughs> I was raised by my mom and my sisters and my aunts. And so for someone to say that, what was it? This is something that, that, that guys, guys do, yeah. not females. <laughs> uh, nah, nah, yeah. that's not, I don't know where they got that from. I don't know who they're hanging out with. My moms and my sisters and aunts, they would probably do this today. And they're all yeah. full grown adults. So again, I don't know where they got that from. Yeah, I once went to my grandma's house and my poor cousin, Eric, hi, Eric. He went downstairs and I went up in his room and I poured scope in his bed and his cologne. And it wasn't very nice and he didn't know for years. Well, maybe it was just hours because as I recall, I, I did get in trouble when I got back home. But this is equal opportunity mischief. Um, it is disturbing though that you would do this to a suspect and who else has it been done to? And that Hitler would be the choice here. I mean, that's his, that's his description, a Hitler-like mustache and eyebrows. Um, who wants to walk around like that when you're already accused of, well, uh, being drunk? Well, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but it looks like the system negatively impacted the police. <laughs> it, that's, yeah, it's, uh, I'm just reading the facts. Again, they're reporting from the LA Times, but it appears the jury didn't take long and said, yeah, the police were vindicated and they should be paid a lot of money for that. Now, I, that's the last thing and then we'll move on because I do think $13.1 million for this. I, look, you do something wrong, you should pay for it. Taxpayers are gonna pay for it. But I feel like sometimes people die the other way around at the hands of police and they don't get that much money, their families. Just saying, mm -hmm. just saying. Let's move on to the strike that doesn't seem to be ending anytime soon. And it's <laughs> there's different factions now joining forces, actors union going on strike along with the writers union. 72 days into the WGA writer strike SAG AFTRA, the actors union will join their entertainment brethren on the picket line. Union leadership announced the strike during a press conference Thursday afternoon and said it would commence at midnight. After the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers refused to meaningfully engage on some topics and on others completely stonewalled SAG after during negotiations. According to Union President Fran Drescher, last time both the WGA and SAG after were on strike was 1960. Both of these unions striking simultaneously effectively shuts down Hollywood. It's a wrap for now. What does SAG-AFTRA want? What's the union asking for? Well, among SAG-AFTRA's demands, increased minimum pay rates, increased streaming residuals, neither of which have kept up with inflation, and improved working conditions, royalty payments, which are contingent on the number of a show's reruns, are no longer reliable. Streaming, which has shifted to shorter seasons over longer periods of time, has made less work available to actors. And union members want guarantees from studio and production companies about how exactly artificial intelligence will be used. They want to protect their likenesses, make sure they are well compensated when any of their work is used to train AI. That's a real sticking point. For those who believe every actor on TV is rich, here is their response, watch. The strike is not just about us trying to be richer. The strike is about protecting our rights. So first of all, so that you know, everybody in this business is not rich. My name is Luke Cook. I'm an actor from The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, Katie Keene, Dynasty, Dollface, and I am not a millionaire. I drive a 2010 Mazda S3. My previous car was a 2006 Ford Taurus. 95% of the actors in SAG 
cannot make a living from acting. They've got to have side hustles, etc. I am one of those actors. I want you to know that all the TV shows that you guys watch, TV yeah. shows and movies, but all the TV shows that you those actors you see someone like me like who's that but what's her name i don't know but i've seen her on a bunch of stuff we are the ones as well who aren't able to make our rent to pay our bills to, to, to get food on our place to take care of our children actors like myself guest stars co-stars etc and we're paid chips i'll give you an example i did a show called dollface last year they put me on a billboard on sunset do you know how much they paid me to be on the billboard zero the amount that they paid me to be in the show was not much better. It's not, you know, this is not an obvious person. I don't have a yacht. I'm a working man. I'm a laborer. I'm a journalist. And all the people that you guys enjoy, when you see all of your favorite TV shows, they are journeyman actors. They are laborers. They are working paycheck to paycheck. So there's that. And what about uh, residuals, you might be asking? Well, let's listen. That's the biggest problem is that uh, the residuals go down and they're paying less and less. I did it. I did a couple episodes of The Nick, I don't know how many years ago, and it it's in some form of streaming now. And yeah, I get like dollar twenty five residuals a couple times a year. Um, that is one example uh, of streaming residuals. Yeah, I did a couple episodes of The Good Fight. Again, three dollar residuals, dollar fifty residuals. Oh my God, I'm about to be so rich. What? You know, residuals were born initially out of the 1960 strike, which is the last time the writers and actors struck together. Before that, all the people who were on I Love Lucy, The Honeymooners, never saw a further penny from all the however many, you know, in today's dollars, millions of dollars that the studios and networks made off of those shows. Piggybacking on that um, Orange is the New Black residual post, I remember a lot of comments back when I posted that were like, guys, 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 they got paid up front. First of all, whether or not we got paid up front, that shit lives, my kids live on in perpetuity. I deserve to get paid for as many streams as that shit gets. Second of all, we did not get paid very well ever and when i say did not get paid very well you would die people were bartenders still people had their second job still they were famous as <laughs> like internationally famous couldn't go outside but had to keep their second jobs because they couldn't afford to not we couldn't afford cabs to set okay so not everybody is Kevin Costner, okay, who's paying his estranged wife $130,000 a month in child support. He can afford it. Not everybody is Kevin though. And then there's AI, okay, concerns that AI will replace gifted actors. Why not, right? Looks real. The AMPTP's proposition to include full body scans as part of production requirements has sparked outrage among SAG after members leading to the ongoing strike. The scans would be owned by the production company indefinitely. While actors would only receive a day's wage for their participation with no compensation for future use of their likeness. That's slick, CBR there with the reporting. This can especially affect those background actors, stadium full of people, hey. Get free lunch, and you get a little check. Maybe not anymore. Listen. Still makes under two hundred dollars a day, and now I want you to think about it as you hear what the Hollywood executives proposed as part of their AI deals. They had a groundbreaking, I'm quoting them, AI proposal. So what do you say to that? That groundbreaking AI proposal they propose our background performers should be able to be scanned, get paid for one day's pay, and their company should own that scan, their image, their likeness, and should be able to use it for the rest of eternity in any project they want with no consent and no compensation. There are no residuals for background acting. So that one time payment, that one day payment, that's all you get for your image forever. Imagine making billions of dollars off a performer that you have paid 100 or $200 for one day's work. Now doesn't that seem gross? Come on, don't you wanna share, be a little bit fair. How much do you need? We'll get to that. 
But I want to show you this, actress Lena Holt posted an alarming tactic studios may be implementing. Boy, this is rich. So Snowpiercer season four did a full body scan and full range of emotion capture of all the series regulars on the show. Not ever telling us the real reason why. Now I know why. And it's really disturbing because I didn't consent. Now, how much money do you need? I deliberately didn't have lunch today because I wanted to get through this list without anything coming up involuntarily. Wait until we show you this. In comparison, here's how the head of the studios have been paid. Now, I thought these were typos. This can't possibly be true, but this is a crack staff we have. They looked it up, they double checked the data. David Zaslaw, okay? He hired that guy who ruined what was left of CNN, Warner Brothers Discovery Inc. <laughs> this can't pop. 498 million, 915,318 dollars. The residual checks aren't even the 318, they're not even the 18. You heard the sound bite. Ari Emanuel. Okay, and remember, wasn't that hit HBO show based on his character? Endeavor Group Holdings, $346,935,367. Iger, who recently said he may sell off ABC networks because you know the models change. We maybe don't need ABC and ESPN in that way. Well, he's got some catching up to do if he wants to get where Zaslav is. But still respectable, $195 million. And it goes on and on and on. Rupert Murdoch on that list. And then his son has the nerve to be on the list right after him. So you see where we're going with this, folks. Patrick Whitesell, as I recall. That's Jeff Bezos' girlfriend's fiance's ex husband. Okay. There's a lot of money in Hollywood, just not for so many gifted actors, writers. It's incredible. That list from CNBC, again, I didn't eat, okay, because I knew I had to get through it. Then there's the callous comments from studio heads. Bob Iger, as we mentioned, the CEO of Disney, telling CNBC Thursday morning that the writer strike and potential SAG strike were, quote, very disturbing. There's a level of expectation that they have that is just not realistic, he said. 195, 195 million a year, they're not realistic. Unfortunately, this flippant attitude from AMPTP comes as no surprise if you've been following the writer's strike. Earlier this week, a studio exec told Deadline the end game is to allow things to drag on until union members start losing their apartments and losing their houses. Jezebel, <laughs> sounds like my ex in court. That last statement prompted this response from actor Ron Perlman. Listen. The one thing before I get off this, Who said we're gonna keep this thing going until people start losing their houses and their apartments? Listen to me. There's a lot of ways to lose your house. Some of it is financial, some of it is karma, and some of it is just figuring out who the f said that, and we know who said that, and where he f lives. There's a lot of ways to lose your house. You wish that on people. You wish that families starve while you're making $27 million a year for creating nothing. Be careful, be really careful, because that's the kind of that stirs you up. Pearl, it sounds like, it, well, he's issuing a threat there. I don't know if that was fully intended, but I do believe, Jeff, that the universe has a great balancing act, and if that indeed is the strategy here. And let's be clear, it seems like it is. Doesn't seem to be, as Fran Drescher, the uh, president of SAG After said, uh, negotiating good faith. The universe has a great balancing act. Where does this end, Jeff? I'm hoping 
that it ends with writers and actors being fairly compensated. There's going to be a compromise in the middle of what we're talking about. I don't know where there's a bunch of great areas, but I'm hoping it can lend itself to, again, people being able to have their work being appreciated in the form of monetary compensation. With all of that said, if we're going to get these people paid, we need actually normal people like me amplifying their cause because it shouldn't come to this. But a lot of people should realize that the same factors that are going into this strike could come after them too. My, my face is all over the internet from hundreds of hours of videos I've posted, which by the way, AI can't replicate all of this. But <laughs> automation is coming for all of us one day. So you better take a stand right now for these people. I don't know why they're going after millionaires, some of them, instead of the billionaires. We should go after the billionaires and multi-millionaires. Yeah, and uh, the the former exec um, or the media mogul Barry Diller, uh, I saw an interview where he said, "Look, here's how you can end this thing: the top execs and the top actors, okay, again, Kevin Costner should take 25 percent less, and that'll be good. That'll square it for everyone because they're making so much more than the rest." I think that there are too many people who subscribe to greed is good. Who needs a half a billion dollars? Some people think they do. Would that be enough? Do you see any compromise here between the haves and the have nots? Sharon, as you <laughs> as you listed earlier, the Murdoch family are definitely the haves. Like, honestly, so the haves and haves nots. If we have what the Murdochs made alone, that can probably fill up what the writers and actors are demanding for right now. So, as far as the compromise, no, I think ultimately, oh gosh, I'm hoping the writers and actors don't lose ground. That's what I'm hoping, but I have a feeling that they might because they might be the desperate ones here because there are people threatening to have actors and writers losing apartments and jobs and wages just to wait this thing out. But we've seen actors and writers make headway in the past with strikes, so hopefully they'll go there and not be replaced with like reality TV or something like that. I can already see it. Kenya is gonna get her own show, okay? Nini's back, okay? No, no. The, the blonde lady who I, I actually like her, Kim, what's her face? The divorce is off and she's gonna probably get another run at her show. Because if this thing goes on for much longer, the other thing that Barry Diller said was Hollywood will end as we know it. And there'll be no coming back from that. Gotta, you gotta give people an out, gotta give them something or else. That's what I think. Welcome back to Indisputable. I'm Sharon Reed in for Dr. Rashad Ritchie. Jeff Wiggins is our special co host today. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, always appreciate your insight. Let's get some, um, some comments. A lot of people are responding uh, to the actors union going on strike along with the writers union. TYT member Ginny B says, It continues to amaze me how inflated CEO pay is across all industries. How these few people can think their paltry contributions compared to the hundreds. Or thousands of employees are worth so much more than everyone else. It's a disgusting system. And it seems to be a real club. They get repurposed into the next gig and they don't want anybody new in. It's just the way it is. Um, we appreciate you, Jenny. Next TYT reporter, Adam Conover said that after Bob Iger made that statement, they got an influx of donations to the union. Remember, Bob Iger says that, you know. They got to be willing to compromise. They're unrealistic, whatever. Okay. Uh, YouTube now. Mosquito Bite says this about the cops who got $13.1 million for being accused of drawing a Hitler mustache on a suspect. They thought they were in a police academy movie. Again, they were exonerated by a jury. We don't know who really did it. Also, did a slur that. Translated, it was in Spanish to male prostitute. Winston Sayer says, fine upstanding officers, uh, tongue in cheek. Uh, and Grumpy Cat, I agree with you, the amount is outrageous. Uh, one or two more for you. See, Michael Henson, thank you so much. I appreciate you always uh, for your contributions. Sounds fishy. If it was me, 
and I knew I was innocent, I wouldn't have to say they discriminated due to gender. I would have just said, I ain't do it, okay? I think that was basically the defense, but there was legalese around that C. Michael, but point well taken. And finally, about the actors, again, Tyler Hackner, thank you to you as well. Solidarity with writers and actors, and that's really the point, Jeff. They've got to stick together because if they divide and conquer here, you know, there's that. But actors want good material, um, they need each other, and it's good to see them standing uh, together. Um, other people stick together for other reasons. And I do want you to well take this one and drink it in, if you will. I hope to Karen Wood. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a in Sunday? The- you're you're still friends. Back off! I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Be more Asian people here. You will be more Asian people here. What are you doing? What are you doing? Right. Are you staying right. proud in this country? Next time we're gonna come. Are you staying proud? Next time we're gonna ten beef. Okay, we're gonna come more. What, what are you doing? Don't worry, we're gonna come What are you doing? Are you, you staying proud for this country? You don't belong here. Ooh, y'all hear that? You don't belong here. Y'all hear that? Y'all heard that? Y'all heard that? Y'all heard that? Yeah. I oh, wish of I could get the license plate. My family fought for this country, bitch. Well, you got to take over the. Oh, really? Uh, we could tell we're collaborating. Yeah. What a collaboration. You got stole the Indian level. Collaboration. You're the most racist I ever saw. I don't know about that. You're the most racist. God damn. The truth comes out. You're the racist. <laughs> people don't go over there. They might say something. So you just want to enjoy a nice afternoon at the lake with your family. And you run into a couple, (laughs) he has on swim trunks, I suppose, with those stars all over them. Again, they're patriots in their view. She has on a bikini, the saggy bottom, and I don't want, I don't know what that was about. It was very saggy. (laughs) Uh, And they were spewing hate, well, you know, if you get in the water and think, you know, it just looked, it was ill-fitted, and that's not even the point. It was what they were spewing, Jeff, and I want you to react to it because I heard the usual fare. I fought for this country, blah, 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 blah. And by the way, I know I am, but what are you? Or I know you are, but what am I? You're the racist too, however that goes. So it's just not original, but they look the part too. Okay, so there, there must be something I'm missing. The people behind the camera, those who are recording, did he did he say they were Asian or what did he say about them? I kind of missed that part towards the beginning. I did as well, but I heard some reference there, and I I think that was perhaps the the well not an allegation, but what they were hurling at someone and demonizing them over perhaps their race. Right, okay, well, whether about their race or nationality, as a black person, I've been told by men exactly like that person that, well, Asians are doing well, why aren't your people doing that? I can that imagine him doing saying something like that a week ago. And now all of a sudden, he has an issue with Asians being in his vicinity. It's kind of like they kind of make up things as they go along. So I don't want to group anyone with him, but I've seen people like him before, it's nothing new. It's nothing new, like I said, not not so original. Um, but again, this is my country was the theme, the tone. Mm-hmm. And so I can attack at will and I can flip you off. And who knows, they probably went to enjoy lunch and on their way there, they probably <laughs> took aim at a few beer cans, okay? And shot those up and moved on to the next ethnic group that they wanted to attack. Um, We're gonna move on because there's an update on another Karen and we do like to keep up with them. And when things go on, um, let you know that something new is in the case. This Karen who harassed a black man, fishing, fired now, you're out of here, okay? There's been an update to that Karen. And uh, first let's remind you of the original crime, if you will. Hello. How are you? Good, how are you? You guys residents here? Are we bothering anyone? Don't 
Don't touch anything. Sorry? All right, well, um, this lake is presently for residents only. So, thank you for filming. I'm not giving you permission to film, so. She's like. Okay, picture of your license plates and forward it on. Hey, so y'all hear what I go through, right? This the third person. This the third person. I'm in my own neighborhood, and a white person came and bothered me while I'm fishing. Another white person came and bothered me while I'm fishing. This the third time. She's like, oh, no. I'm not giving you permission to film. This is my phone. I can film and do whatever I want. I study the law. <laughs> I study the law. Thank you. I'm sorry. Hey, well, well, don't, don't leave now. Do you want to say, hey, do you live here? Where you live? What's your address? Where do you live? <laughs> Where do you live? This is unbelievable. Where do you live? Uh, why? What, what's your name, by the way? Because at the next Karen? meeting, I'm definitely going to mention you. Her name is Karen. <laughs> wait, wait. Matter of fact, let me get your... Let me get your... Um, let me turn this phone around. Let me go ahead and get yours. Apparently he does know. He knows at least the bylaws of this gated community. Okay, so he saw that. The Karen who approached Anthony Gibson and his companion while they were fishing, minding their own business, at a local lake in the West Georgia city of Columbus. She's been fired. She caught something, all right. A trip to the unemployment line. Her employer said, you gotta go, okay? Mind your own business. The background. Identified only as Tanya by her former employers, the woman approached Anthony Gibson and inquired about why he was fishing on the private property where she resided. <laughs> Unbeknownst to her, Gibson's father owned a home in the gated community and was fishing under his dad's authorization. That according to the Daily Mail. Gibson calls the area his neighborhood. You heard him in the video say that. According to the bylaws of the community, guests of homeowners are permitted to use the lake. Let a black star with the reporting. The woman also did not know that Gibson was an aspiring social media influencer, had documented the exchange between the two and posted it online. In just days, the clip went viral, 7.5 million views and eventually reached the place where Tanya, is it Tanya or Tanya? I think it depends on where you grow up. See glass therapy, her former employer. Her employer posted a statement about the termination, let's quote it. We stand against discrimination of all forms. We have terminated our business relationship with the independent contractor, Tanya or Tanya, in order to uphold our values and standards. It continued, we strive to be a service to our community and do whatever we can to accommodate the needs of it, operating with integrity. If I need therapy, Jeff, I may drive an hour or two away and go to Sea Glass. Because I like that they didn't just fire her, but they issued a statement as well saying, not so much. What say you? Well, it's probably Tanya, but yeah, that's so. neither, yeah, neither here nor there. Moving on. Um, I'm glad the internet works so fast in this situation in order for the positivity of justice. Because we just did this, I was here Friday. And we just reported this, and so it was great to come back Monday. Thank you for the producers who have me so often, um, and see that justice has been served. I am really happy about that. Although it hasn't circulated enough that people will not leave this man alone. He just wants to go fishing. Why do you think, and it is a phenomenon, I'm nosy, okay? I've been a reporter my whole life. I, I like to learn about things. I like to inquire and ask questions, but I don't have a thirst to sneak up on a black man in a fishing hat as he's casting his pole and ask him where he lives and what are you doing on this property? What is this desire to mind everyone else's business? Yeah, so I was gonna ask you because uh -huh. like they, they see him and I was gonna ask like, are they wondering how did you black man get to such a nice area or Get to do something <laughs> that, you know, where you can be minding your own business. How are you here? I know how we're here. What are you doing here? Is that what we're seeing? Because that's how I'm yeah. taking it. I think you're taking it exactly right. They have no concept, these Karens, male Karens as well, that you could actually work for a living, have a father in your life who says, sure, son, come on over to my gated property. I want you to go fishing over here, okay? And 
Hopefully no one will disturb you. It's sad that he was disturbed multiple times, but now Karen has all the time in the world to fish. And I hope she catches a big one, okay? I do, much more indisputable when we come right back. Welcome back to Indisputable, I'm Sharon Reed in for Dr. Rashad Ritchie. Jeff Wiggins is our special guest co-host today. Um, we've had an eclectic mix of stories, if you will, and you're already commenting on them. Uh, so let's get you some of the comments. Uh, YouTube Snack Panther, well, is asking a question that I think all of us in our minds, if we didn't blurt it out, we're thinking when we <laughs> saw the story of the racist, patriotic Karen couple harassing the group by a lake, a simple question. The hell is this? Okay, I'd like to know as well. But they just keep, you know, they're they're not going to stop. Uh, Snack Panther, um, Jamal G, the woman uh, who was harassing the black man fishing in the update. And as you mentioned, Jeff, we revealed the story on Friday. Today is Monday. She's fired, and Jamal G says consequences, repercussions. Believe that. We do, and now she does as well. Uh, we wanna thank Bernie the Kiwi Dragon, member for 13 months. Appreciate him a lot. Fishing guy, I baited my hooks with bait to draw fish. I didn't think I'd be catching more Karens than mm. fish, okay? Mm. Well, it works out like that if you dare dip a toe into a gated community that Karen, was she barefoot by the way, Jeff? I, I, I felt like she was barefoot. But I don't know. In my mind, she was, yes. Yeah, exactly. It, it is what it is. Uh, we'll get you one more. Uh, and I think this is an important point. Um, country music, there's gotta be a song or two, no matter who you are, who you can't get out of your head. My mother used to listen to Kenny Rogers, okay? Uh -huh. Patsy, what's her name? Klein, is it? She used to love them. And now here comes Luke Combs. Cover of Tracy Chapman's song, but it's causing much debate. See what you think. Country music star Luke Combs has topped the country music charts with a cover of Tracy Chapman's song, Fast Car. But decades prior, as a black queer woman, Chapman would have almost zero chance of that achievement herself in country music. Musicians of color in country music. The numbers remain bleak. Recent study by data journalist Jan Deem and musicologist Jada Watson reported that fewer than 0.5% of songs played on country radio in 2022 were by women of color and LGBTQ plus artists. Watson's previous work shows that songs by women of color and LGBTQ plus artists were largely excluded from radio playlists for most of the two decades prior. Washington Post with the reporting, Emily R doing the legwork here. Similar pattern has existed in country music for years, said Tanner Davenport, a Nashville native, co-director of the Black Opry. White country singers struck gold this past decade, releasing songs heavily influenced by R&B and hip hop, but few black artists are even signed to major Nashville labels. I wonder why. The immediate success of Combs' fast car, Davenport said, kind of just proves that when you put a white face on black art, it seems to be consumed a lot easier. And we should tell you, this is nothing new. In the past, artists like Pat Boone, Elvis Presley, they established, if you will, their careers with covers of songs made by black artists like Fats Domino, and Big mm -hmm. Mama Thornton, respectively. And look at the legacy that lives on. Despite this, Chapman is gracious about the cover. I never expected to find myself on the country charts, but I'm honored to be there. I'm happy for Luke and his success and grateful that new fans have found and embraced Fast Car. Very diplomatic she's been, I don't know what other way she could be. The Washington Post has said what perhaps others, many even, feel about this, um, you weigh in first, Jeff. So this might be a situation where multiple things are true at the same time. Yes, we know that many white artists take black work and make themselves famous for it when those black artists couldn't have made it into industry for themselves because of how they look. Now, 
Tracy Chapman's song was big and famous in its time. I think it was a folk song. I think it's pretty much considered a folk song in its genre. For Luke Combs to take it, not change anything about it, and then make it a country song is a little fishy and does have some remnants of racism in and of itself. With that said, I do want to add some details and nuance. Some black artists have taken white songs and made them famous as well. However, they changed a lot about those songs. One of the things I have in mind was the Dolly Parton, I Will Always Love You. Whitney Houston took that and dominated everything about it. So yeah, Luke Holmes, a little bit of racism, but it's gone the other way also. Yeah, and in the way it's being received, there are so many talented artists and to learn that this is 2023, and as we reported from the Washington Post there, not many are signed to these Nashville record companies. Mm-hmm. And by the way, Dolly Parton made about $10 million off of her royalties. Mm-hmm. And she praised Whitney Houston. And then she took the money and she said, I'm gonna give back to the black community in some way. Mm-hmm. And she bought an office building in the heart of black Nashville and called it the house that Whitney built because Dolly Parton's a real one and an ally. But I do think that you, it's undeniable, and nobody's it's not necessarily calling out Combs, but it's undeniable that what changed a white face instead of a queer black woman who's a tremendous artist. Absolutely. She's a tremendous artist. I love her. I'm going to download the song again. But she's going to get paid from this. She's been gracious and decent about it. Um, but you wonder, because it's going to take perhaps country music to take a good look at itself. And it's a very um, insulated core group with not much diversity. They'll have to change if they want to, but they're very protective it seems of what's going on in Nashville and the genre overall. I'll give you the last word. Yeah, I do want to clarify. I'm not saying what Luke Combs did was sure. racist. He took a dope song, decided to sing it because the song is incredible. Tracy Chapman is incredible. But the fact that it made it the same song, the exact same way, didn't rearrange anything and made it to the country charts, that has some little remnants of racism that I don't really like. I think you're exactly right. And, and you know, um, I was thinking that. <laughs> I saw, I think it was Kerry Washington and something over the weekend. And I thought about it, there's so many great black actresses who have not received Oscars or nominations or recognition mainstream. I was watching a movie, I believe it was a Will Packer movie on a plane recently, Girls Trip. And it's a fun comedy, of course. but. It reminded me that there's so many who we love, we love them. And when it comes to mainstream, they're not getting their due. Maybe one or two will squeak squeak through, remember Hallie's acceptance speech? And it just makes me sad because at the end of the day, we all just wanna be appreciated for good work and money can't solve all of that. So even though we know Tracy's gonna get paid, it does seem to me that it it takes us and it makes us feel less than at times. If you're a person of color, you just want your due. You just want your due. And maybe that feeds seamlessly into this next story because it's a real concern. Women of color using harmful skin lightening products. Real concern. Skin lightening, also called whitening or bleaching, is a multi billion dollar industry. Products that can damage the skin and that researchers say promote a dangerous message about beauty, social value. But people who use these products, primarily marketed to women, seldom understand the health risk of using the over the counter chemicals. Northwestern University researchers found in a study recently published in the International Journal of women's dermatology. Shar Adams of NBC News with the reporting. Now the researchers surveyed hundreds of people, majority of them black women. Many of the respondents reported using skin lightening products with a portion admitting that they didn't know the products contain harmful ingredients. 
okay? Mercury cause rashes, swelling, discoloration, and more. The study's lead author is Dr. RuPaul Kindu, founder and director of the Northwestern Medicine Center for Ethnic Skin and Hair. Dr. Kindu said, quote, the vast majority of times skin lightening is really used with the goal of treating a medical dermatological disease or post inflammatory hyperpigmentations. But sometimes it is used in the space of wanting lighter skin and the constructs of beauty compounded by light and dark skin. She continued, we've done other work in that space trying to understand why people might use these products. It's back to lighter skin being more aesthetic or considered something of value among certain communities. This is centuries in the making, generations in the making. Respondents who use skin lighteners reported experiencing colorism in their lives. Colorism or color bias is a system of inequality in which lighter skin on non-white people is considered more beautiful, socially acceptable, deserving of privileges often denied to people with darker skin. Black men with light skin are perceived to have more education than those with dark skin. Skin tone plays a role when job applicants with dark skin compete with light skinned applicants. Meanwhile, black people with darker skin face harsher prison sentences than those with light skin, according to research published by the University of Chicago. Northwestern's recent study highlights the health disparities for non white dark skinned people. Although colorism is pervasive among black Americans, such bias is a global issue and exists across nationalities and ethnicities. It has persisted in India for centuries as a result of casteism, colonialism, and in 2021 Pew Research Center poll of Latinos. Several said they faced discrimination and barriers to upward mobility as a result of having dark skin in Hollywood starring roles tend to go to light skin actors over dark ones. So Ronald Hall, a Michigan State University professor has written several articles and books on colorism, including interdisciplinary perspectives on colorism and the historical globalization of colorism. Let's quote the professor. The one common denominator that I can point to, we're all dominated by Eurocentric power structures, which Define our ideals. Whiteness has been idealized. People of color don't think about that. They just buy into expressing those ideals. Both Kandu and Hall agree that because whiteness is linked to social value and upward mobility, people are often willing to take great risks to obtain lighter skin. Skin lightening industry has faced criticism for years, especially as the US Food and Drug Administration Warn consumers as recently as last year about the dangers of illegally marketed over the counter lightning products. These products often contain toxic ingredients, can cause permanent damage if used for long periods of time. Kundu said, still, these ingredients remain widely available in products sold in stores online and through social media. Now, Hall said the first step in eradicating. Colorism and its consequences is to adequately confront the problem. This is an issue that every African American, every person of color knows and experiences, said Hall. But people don't want to talk about it, they want to pretend it doesn't exist. So that, in effect, really sustains it. Once you confront it, then you can act on it. So, Jeff, the authors, the reporting, we're people of color, okay? We know this is a thing. How do we talk about it in a in a society that won't even allow us to read certain books in some states and jurisdictions anymore? Where do we go with this? It's being honest, and you just did it a second ago when you mentioned how this is a problem in black communities as well. I'm on the lighter side of the black spectrum. I'm a little darker now because of July. I'm somewhere on the number four on my toaster when my kids make Eggo waffles. That's my complexion right now. Get a little lighter in December. With that being said, 
this doesn't necessarily apply to me. I'm on the 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 well perceived side of this. Darker skinned people who are darker than me, they don't get treated as well. We've seen this when it comes to job interviews and 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 roles uh, in Hollywood and everything else that goes along with this. It is very difficult, but at least honest. Be honest about it. I probably get more privilege because I'm lighter and I had nothing to do with it. My dad is ultra light skin. So like I get it. He has hazel eyes and stuff like that, whatever. Yeah. So yeah, at least be honest about it and be forthright when it comes to this information. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I used to tell my daughter when I when I finally taught her how to make coffee for me that I want it to look like this. You understand? That's how much cream I want you to put in it because it's how I like my coffee. Okay. And she got it. Okay. Um, a couple of things, uh, the warnings. Here's the thing. If you've been brought up in a society that tells you that you are less than and you cannot achieve all that you dream to be, including when you look in the mirror feeling good about yourself, be damned the warnings. Women, all people are willing to take the risk. This really feels like that. That it's not that they don't know by and large, it's that they don't want to know or they don't care. It's worth it to just be in that lighter club. The other thing is, it's so stupid. If we really sat down and analyzed colorism, Jeff, and this Eurocentric way of thinking about what is beautiful, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. What is coveted is the one thing that if you don't have that skin, you probably can't change, can't change enough. And that's why it was done. But we don't talk. So when we, when you say what's real, and getting to the heart of things and just speaking it, isn't that part of it? We have to unpack all of it. Yes, definitely we have to unpack it. There's a bunch of implicit, explicit bias that we have that we need to like look down, search within ourselves to say, what is this about? Why am I like this? And not just presume that we aren't that way. I think we all are like that a little bit. So maybe we could just talk about it a lot more than we currently do. You're absolutely right. Um, it's going to take all of us coming together. Much more indisputable. I'm Sharon Reed in for Dr. Rashad Ritchie. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Indisputable. I'm Sharon Reed in for Dr. Rashad Ritchie, who has the day off. Um, let's launch right into it. You ever been waiting on your money? Waiting on a check to clear or waiting on a deposit, a paycheck? Who knows? Well, <laughs> This woman knows about it. She is suing the bank after it took her $24,000 disability check. Hmm. In Illinois, Charlotte Warren received a check from the US Treasury for $24,158.14 for back payment of disability funds due to her severe asthma and other disabilities. Next day, she went to a local bank in Naperville, Illinois. April 17th, she was shocked to see her account was closed and the bank had no explanation as to why. <laughs> hey, where's my money? Okay, give you a little background on the failed withdrawal. The Illinois woman filed a federal discrimination lawsuit against Bank of America after it accepted her deposit of a check she received from the US Treasury, closed her account and refused to give her any money or explanation, as we said. When Warren returned to the bank the next day with her daughter, she went to the teller and asked about her account. The teller responded saying, no, you don't have an account. Lana Blackstar with the details. Charlotte's daughter, Shivana, assured the bank teller that it was a government check. There's not much to figure out, it's a government check. It's easy to verify, her funds should be available right now, said Shivana to the teller. The bank then told Charlotte, there's nothing we can do. There has to be something you can do, Charlotte responded to the teller. Shortly after the deflection, Charlotte and her daughter left the bank without any money, but with so many questions, unanswered questions. They were confused and angry. Charlotte was frustrated after they left the bank and told NBC Chicago News, after fighting for it all this time, I don't have anything. You could just take it away and you're okay with it. She expresses that she Quote, had to fight to battle with the Social Security Disability Insurance Office to receive the funds. And now they were being denied by the bank. 
because they question the validity of the check. Mm. The biggest one that got me was when the manager said, sometimes they have drug deals. Can you imagine? Charlotte told NBC Chicago, or criminal activities linked to large accounts. Bank of America also closed her account just days after she opened it. More than a month passed and the bank offered no valid explanation. So the Warrens decided to hire Gail Eisenberg as their attorney. After Eisenberg took over the case and attempted to negotiate with the bank, they were ignored, resulting in the attorney filing for a federal discrimination lawsuit against Bank of America. We certainly believe it was intentional discrimination, Eisenberg told NBC Chicago. This is a US Treasury check, so the circumstances under which a hold would have been appropriate are confounding. And then there were all the excuses, 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 excuses for this. The woman fought for her check, it's valid, and she just wanted her money. According to CBS Chicago, checks from the US Treasury are typically available the next day. And federal law says that a hold shouldn't be more than nine days. The bank says its actions were consistent with regulatory funds availability requirements. And her account was flagged by analytics, which have rules in place to prevent fraud. I'd love to see, <laughs> let's pause right there. I'd love to see how these analytics, okay? And how they decide <laughs> whose accounts <laughs> to flag. I, I'm no computer wizard, but something, what's that I smell? Okay, what, we'll give you more. Wow, I need to see it. After 50 days in a seven week battle, Charlotte won her federal lawsuit and her funds were returned to her. Bank of America also never provided any explanation as to why her check was held for 50 days, but says they regret the amount of time it took to get her money back. It's so frustrating to be black in America and not be able to do simple things. Again, Atlanta Black Star with the quote there. And isn't that? What we're talking about when trauma's all of it. I just want to check the mail without Karen popping up. Go fishing. I just want to cash my check. And why is everyone attacking me? That's what it's like being black in America too often, Jeff. I want the analytics here. I'm like salivating. Do you know what they are? No, I was. I, hopefully, people couldn't hear me typing and clicking because I was looking <laughs> up job descriptions and what people at banks yeah. should and should not be doing, just in case there's like an investigation as to why that you're part. presuming <laughs> something happened because of a drug deal. Like, is that your jurisdiction? Is that what you're supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're getting paid yeah. to do? I don't mm -hmm. understand why that. Well, I just lied on camera. I apologize. I do understand yeah. why someone will presume. To even assume a drug deal was being in place. With that being said, that's people's money. You don't mess with that. Like that's a, might be a common theme about what we've been talking about today with the actors and writers and everything like that. People are already hurting in the financial and economic realm of this world. Please leave people's money alone. Yeah, and I think I hope that she didn't just get the twenty-four thousand da 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 da. And what was it, fourteen cents? I hope that they were penalized. Interest plus a penalty here, what are you doing? And I think they should be forced to explain why they did it. I'd be curious to see where this particular Bank of America branch is located in Chicago. Is it one of the rare banking institutions in a black neighborhood? Is it talking to me about drugs, drug dealers, large checks? This is Bank of America. You've not seen a US Treasury check, you can pick up the phone. They don't even have to pick up the phone. All that typing they do, it's not just at the airlines where it's so loud. You know that typing they do when you're at the window? This is just verify it, verify, it, okay? Instead, they didn't do it. So thank you, Attorney Eisenberg. Thank you to the Warrens for fighting for their rights. New York cop. Kill a mentally ill individual while he's eating fruit. Let's put up the picture full mass. Now an investigation is being ordered. New York Attorney General orders an investigation into the killing of a mentally ill man who was having an episode. Jarrell Garris, 37 years of age, died one week after being shot 
by an officer in uh, in New Rochelle, New York, after being accused of stealing fruit. That's according to Fox 5 New York. Garris was approached by police around 4.30 PM after he was allegedly seen eating a banana and grapes from a grocery store in Lincoln Avenue near North Avenue. After 911 was called, Mr. Garris was approached by Detective Stephen Kahn and officers Carrie Bird and Gabrielle Shabri about food theft. The situation escalated when Garris, the victim, decided to avoid the officers by crossing the street with his hands in his pocket. Remember, he was experiencing a mental health episode. One of the officers said, "Hey, listen, you're just trying to have a we're just trying to have a conversation. What were you doing in the store? You were eating the food?" Question mark. Shortly after, no answer from Garris. You're under arrest," said Officer Khan. Then Garris asked, "For what?" Coincidental body cam failure. Immediately following the questions and responses between the officers and Mr. Garris, the body cam video then shows two of the officers attempted to arrest Garris, and a struggle ensues as one of the officers yells to taser him. A few seconds later, the male cop yells, "He's got a gun! He's got a gun!" The video, which at this point appears to show Garris with a small object in one hand. Ends before the actual shooting. According to the police, Garris went for one of the officer's guns. Come to me. We've had officers tell us right here at Indisputable that they will yell gun in order to justify a killing. They've told us this off record. They said it directly to us. They will yell the word gun to provide the legal defense necessary so that they can get away with murder. Now, why does that allow them to get away with murder? Because they are allowed to have what's called a subjective standard when it comes to killing somebody. Meaning, as long as they can prove that in their minds, they believe, they believe that there was a gun, even though there was not one. As long as they believed it was, they can kill someone legally. So they will yell, gun. When there's no gun. Now, when you hear the audio, he has a gun. It's very different from he's trying to grab my gun, mm. which wasn't said. This was part of the spin, ladies and gentlemen. Justice for Jarrell, all right? Garris died on Westchester Medical Center. He died at that medical center one week after being on life support. Okay, during a new Rochelle City Council meeting on July 11th, the community demanded that all of the body cam footage be released in the name of transparency. That's the reason we have the body cams, release it. Uh, the family attorney, William O. Wagstaff III, says that the public has been given the veneer of transparency by only releasing part of the video. The family attorney said, quote, we've gotten what appears to be a veneer of transparency. What true transparency means is releasing all video, all information. And they haven't done it. Acting president of the NAACP in New Rochelle, Asia says, the police are not the judge and jury and executioner. Garris reportedly suffered from schizophrenia and other mental health issues, according to his family. Reverend Jamal Hollis noted that he was having an episode on the day he was shot and criticized the grocery store for calling the police in the first place. It is obvious that the day, that day, he was having an episode, said Hollis, the family reverend. I think it's important to know. That when you own a store in a community and you have the community patronize your business, there should be some know how and empathy and how you treat everybody in that community. I concur 100%. These are community supported for profit entities, they have an obligation to that local community. There was a situation in Atlanta 
where a convenience store had over 70 carjackings in less than one year. They refused to put up cameras. They refused to put security on the premises. And then a judge got carjacked at the same place. Mm. No one knew about the aggregate data of that many carjackings. Did I make the news? Now, when the judge got carjacked, all of a sudden, we all wear damn near 80 people have been carjacked in less than a year. It made it to my desk. I called the chairman of the county commission for Fulton County at that time. I said, the store needs to have security cameras and they need to have a 25 hour security team in order to protect the residents. The chairman told me that he was powerless to do so. This was a Wednesday on that Thursday. I made another call so that the store would simply enact security measures to protect the community. Nothing happened that Friday. I called for my radio listeners to shut down that store, and they did. We shut down that store Monday, uh, from Friday to Monday. Nobody could enter that property. On Monday, I got a call from the chairman of the county commission. They said, we think we've worked something out. On that Tuesday, they had a 20 plus thousand dollar security system and a 24 hour security staff at that location. Don't allow these establishments to tell you no. They are in your community, all right, yours. Okay, dear brother, this is once again another element of our cause and effect of how we deal with those experiencing a mental health crisis and the responsibility needed from not only law enforcement, but also private entities that benefit from the community. What say you? I'm glad you gave us detail about that last uh, item that you presented because I'm, it kind of gives me hope, but it's kind of also infuriating that it had to come to that to yep. where now there's suddenly not only funding, but know how in order to get the, uh, the necessary infrastructure to keep people safe. So with that said, as you alluded to earlier, when it comes to he's got a gun, never mind the fact that they didn't say he's trying to take my gun, he's got a gun. The same thing is said when it comes to resisting arrest. He's resisting, yep. say it out loud a few times, then they can do what they came to do in the first place. No de-escalation techniques, none of that. Going straight to what they know how to do, which is brutality in this situation. Yeah, and many are saying, well, it was obvious he was having a mental health issue. Uh, this was not someone trying to commit crimes against humanity. We will follow this story, bring you updates as it comes. Now, I love this story. I love this family. They want to be together. A black Las Vegas man stepped up big time and adopted three brothers. Aren't they cute? I love them. I just love them. In March 2022, People Magazine featured six groups of siblings in foster care waiting adoption. Three young brothers, 11 year old Tavion, 10 year old Irion, and nine year old Tavon were among those featured. Wow, I just can't stop staring at them. That's not bad either. 45 year old Jason Smith, who works as a human resources exec at Caesars Entertainment in Las Vegas. He saw the article and he decided he and the boys would be a perfect match. Smith started fostering them in April 2022. And in June, an interview with WDSU's digital team stated he was fully invested and reassured them and their caseworker that this is it. The brothers had experienced a rough few years after living in five different homes in five years. They were also recently separated from their two younger sisters after the girls were adopted by a Nevada couple. In early April 2022, Smith met the boys for the first time after school at a McDonald's. They immediately clicked, let's make sure they like you, Smith recalls the caseworker saying. Play date, then a sleepover followed. It just took off, he says. From day one, he treated them like they were his own. Says Benaletta Simpkins, a caseworker in the Clark County Department of Children and Family Services. It was never about Jason, Simpkins adds. He was exactly what the kids needed. 
The trio had moved into Smith's home later that month. Then Smith officially became their legal guardian nine months later. Smith told WDSU he felt compelled to adopt the boys to honor his deceased father and felt like he was passing along his father's legacy. The adoption was completed in Nevada, a courtroom there with 30 of his friends cheering him and 30 more watching online. Smith said the judge was quote, blown away. And a black star with that nugget there. Smith is teaching the boys how to cook, clean, do laundry, and has them attending church regularly. He often takes them to Chili's or skateboarding or hiking after church. In addition to spending quality time with the trio, Smith makes plans once a month with the foster care parents of their younger sisters, Ayana seven, Shakia four, for them all to hang out. We're living a normal life here, says Tavion, who is the oldest. Irion, the middle child, says the best part is they are able to talk, help, and love each other. We get to have a family and we don't have to go to another house again and again and again. Irion told people. The new father says the boys have brought purpose into his life. Foster care training prepares you for the worse. But I haven't experienced any of that, said Smith to people. He added, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. It's like God wanted us to be together. Black children are overrepresented in the US foster care system. It's according to the data. They spend a longer time in the system than white children. While black children accounted for roughly 14% of the children in the nation in 2019, they made up 23% of the foster care population. I love this family and I feel like they are indeed meant to be together. This is the best of the best stories. And to know that all these kids wanted Jeff was something simple, just a home so they could be together. It sounds like they they enjoy doing the chores and helping and just being part of this this nucleus. what says, what say you? Well, in addition to how impressive it is for him to, <clears throat> for this man to foster three siblings so they could stay together and meet up with the parents who fostered their other siblings. What I like most is that the things that he does with these boys day to day, it's like he's raising them to be another version of him. So then maybe one day they can do the same thing he did for future kids who are in foster, uh, foster care. So this is a beautiful story. Yeah, I I couldn't agree with you more. And it's like, um, there's a lot of good families out there. And there's a lot of people who sacrifice and, and, and do right by kids. We often have the horror stories, but this just seems like the perfect match. This man, this particular man and his village, it sounds like he already has a village in place, mm. is exactly what the doctor ordered. And the fact that he is taking his boys, And making sure that they stay connected to their sisters um, is a beautiful thing. And I, I do, you know, I've thought about adoption myself, didn't do it. But I hope that with all of the children who are just needing something, five, did it say five homes in five years, Jack? Mm -hmm. That's unconscionable for kids who just want to be what is quote unquote normal. I'll give you the last word and then we're out of here. Yeah, this man is providing the safety and security that we need, like the needs that we have, he's giving that. And that's all somebody was really seeking at this point. He's giving them so much more. Yeah, he is. Well, God bless him. I hope that at some point they'll be on the program because I'd like to hear more of their story and updates. Um, so hopefully we'll catch up with them. Uh, tell people where they can find you real quick, uh, if you can, Jeff. Yeah, Rebel HQ every day of the week. And I also have a YouTube channel called We Gonna Be All Right. We Gonna Be All Right. Um, Much love to you. Always appreciate your insight. I'm Sharon Reed, in for Dr. Rashad Ritchie. um, And we'll see you in the future there. This is Indisputable on TYT.